Today we're discussing the crisis facing our oceans and what this means for the millions of people in developing nations who rely on the sea for their food and their livelihoods. It's the livelihood of a whole lot of people. And when you say um, livelihood, it's sort of even limited. You have, it's the culture, it's integrated within our culture. So it's part of our existence, part of our way of life. The sea means everything to us. It's become increasingly apparent that the world's oceans and all they contain are in grave danger. Impacted by overfishing, climate change and pollution, the statistics are alarming. It's estimated 85% of fisheries are already depleted. The oceans are in poor health, becoming warmer and more acidic, with ocean dead zones now roughly the size of New Zealand. Yeah, the main environmental challenges, some of which you described in your introduction, really are too many fishing vessels chasing too few, too few fish out there on the oceans. We have huge demand for seafood around the world, and we have a lot of uh, countries and companies wishing to take advantage of that situation. So there are a lot of fishing boats out there chasing dwindling fishing resources. The uh, second issue that we're probably facing is global environmental change. If we look at our oceans, if we look at the effects of global warming, increasing ocean acidification where the waters become more acidic and less hospitable to our uh, marine life, and we're looking at warming ocean temperatures, all those put enormous pressure on the marine resources and therefore on the people and the livelihoods and the economies that depend upon them. Well, if you look at the Pacific and the resources and potential sources of growth they have, for most islands, what's underwater is their real source of wealth, both actually and potentially. The exceptions would be, of course, Papua New Guinea has some pretty amazing gas resources and mineral wealth. Uh, similarly, the Solomon Islands has minerals, but in general it's fish. And to quote some statistics, for example, Kiribati, you talked about the contribution to GDP. In terms of their government, government revenue, their total budget comes 47% from fish licensing fees. And that's at today's quite low capture levels. Tuvalu, for example, uh, the figures in the range of 25 to 30%. So without uh, without fish, many of these um, islands could not exist as viable states. Now, I think the easiest way to think about this is if we look at our resources in the ocean out there, think of it like a large stack of gold in the bank. You have these rich resources, the fish, the coral reefs for tourism, the uh, oil and gas and uh, undersea mineral deposits for some countries. These are enormous amounts of uh, wealth that's available for the development and well-being of these countries. We can spend that money very quickly, and we can spend the inheritance for our children and future generations, or we can spend that wisely, slowly, reinvest, conserve that capital stock, live off the interest that we earn from it rather than mining the actual capital itself. And in that way, we can sustain those riches into the future to benefit not only the current generations in the Pacific, but those of the future as well. The Western and Central Pacific accounts for about 55% of global tuna supply. That's worth about four and a half billion dollars a year in what we call landed value. That's not even wholesale, just getting the fish onto the boat. Um, Pacific Islands of that figure capture somewhere in the range of five to seven percent. And so the rest is accruing to other, other parties essentially, what we call the distant water fishing nations. And the real challenge there is that it all depends upon all these countries come into an agreement on the management outcomes for those fisheries. And if you think about the different political agendas, the different economic agendas, the differences in power and influence at the global level, it's very challenging for those regional management organizations to really get a grip on what has to be done with those stocks and take action in the short term that's needed. There's a lot of very, very good debate at those meetings. Um, the Pacific Island countries in particular are very vocal and very effective at articulating what needs to be done to conserve those resources. But reaching that final decision where major actions are taking, not only just to conserve the tuna stocks, but to manage the bycatch of sharks, turtles, other marine animals that are affecting those fisheries, just doesn't happen because it takes 100% consensus at those meetings. And all it takes is one country that doesn't like what's going on for some reason to say, no, we don't like that, and things won't happen. So I think. At the global scale, there are things that are happening that are worrying in the sense that they're not acting quick enough to the challenges that are on the horizon. Uh, at the regional level, things are starting to come together.